Would you all pray with me? Oh Lord, we, we come before you, and as we do, we acknowledge that you are, you are the one who is worthy to be praised. You are the one who is worthy of all glory and honor and uh, might and wealth and wisdom and, and riches and, and blessing and all of it. All that your word says, Lord, we, we recognize that you are worthy. You are God and we are not. And God, that's a comfort for those of us who are your children. We, we, we come to you, the one who is sovereign over all of it, in the midst of uh, turmoil even. Um, whether personal or, or whatever, I just think of the state of our country and uh, the amount of infighting that is occurring and uh, dangerous times and perhaps scary times. And, um, and while things seem turbulent here in the United States of America in 2024, Lord, this is a fallen world and it's been a fallen world. And empires have risen and crumbled, but you and your word have and will always remain. And so we come to you, the one who is sovereign over all of it, who has power to change circumstances and and power even to let us sit in them, where you do so much of your mighty work so often in our lives in the waiting. God, help us to be content, even as it seems like the storm is raging all around us. Help us to act where you call us to act. Help us to things clearly in light of your word. Lord, we need you. This is our acknowledgement of that. And Lord, forgive us for all the ways that we have not trusted you, even this week, even this morning. Lord, the ways that we have relied on our own strength, our own abilities. God, you could take all of that away. All we need is you. Lord, help us to remind ourselves of that today. God, I pray that you would do a work by your word in our lives, in our hearts today, whether believers or unbelievers, would you challenge believers? Would you save unbelievers if there are any here with us today? And we need you to do that work by your spirit. God, we pray all of these things in your name, giving you all the glory, the only name that deserves all praise, the name of Jesus Christ, our King. Amen. Well, church, I would encourage you to stay standing for the reading of God's word. We are in Matthew chapter 9. We are going to close out this chapter, this section of the book of Matthew. We're going to pick it up in verse 18. Matthew chapter 9, verse 18, and we'll read all the way through to the end of the chapter. Matthew writes these words. While he was saying these things to them, behold, a ruler came in and knelt before him, saying, My daughter has just died. But come and lay your hand on her, and she will live. And Jesus rose and followed him with his disciples. And behold, a woman who had suffered from a discharge of blood for twelve years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment. For she said to herself, If I only touch his garment, I will be made well. Jesus turned, and seeing her, he said, Take heart, daughter. Your faith has made you well. And instantly the woman was made well. And when Jesus came to the ruler's house and saw the flute players and the crowd making a commotion, he said, go away, for the girl is not dead but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But when the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took her by the hand, and the girl arose. And the report of this went throughout all that district. And as Jesus passed on from there, two blind men followed him, crying aloud, Have mercy on us, son of David. When he entered the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? They said to him, Yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes, saying, According to your faith, be it done to you. And their eyes were opened. And Jesus sternly warned them, See that no one knows about it. But they went away and spread his fame through all that district. As they were going away, behold, a a demon-oppressed man who was mute was brought to him. And when the demon had been cast out, the mute man spoke. And the crowds marveled, saying, Never was anything like this seen in Israel. But the Pharisee said, He casts out demons by the prince of demons. 
And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. This is the word of the Lord for this morning. You may be seated. Well, good morning, church. Good morning. So good to see you all here. I love what Scott said. Uh, He's like, I'm so excited walking up there because I get to see all my friends. Yes, (laughs) that's exactly right. How good are Sunday mornings? We, yes, we need this. We need this so badly. Six days out of the week, we're in the world, and the world is trying to have its influence on us, but, but on Sunday morning, we get to come here and be refreshed and sing songs about our good and gracious God with God's awesome people. Fallen, albeit, but awesome nonetheless. Thank you, Lord. Well, this morning, I want to take you back in time. Uh, We're going to have to use our imaginations a bit, but I think we can do it. And I want to take you back in time to, um, I'm sure there's a more technical term for this, but I'm just going to call it an old-timey circus, okay? Now, bringing something like the circus into a sermon, I think we need to abandon certain dispositions that we have, predispositions. Uh, We're not talking about a circus in like the negative pejorative sense, like like when you come home and you have many kids and things are going crazy, okay? I don't mean it like that, and I don't mean it like, uh, like a freak show either, okay? I want you to picture that you're living in a relatively small community back in the day, a community with a culture that is consistent from house to house. You've lived there your whole life. It's the only life you've ever known, And life outside of the life you now live, you've only read about in books or in publications. No cell phone, no TV, no internet. I know it's hard to imagine, right? And then this circus rolls into town and you get to see animals and exhibits and athletics like you've never seen before. Imagine being a child and experiencing this, like the wonder of it all. And up until now, those circus attractions, they were only... Uh, they, were, they were like one step shy of fiction to you, right? You, you read about lions and elephants and, and these things, but they couldn't possibly be real, and yet here they are before your eyes. This is groundbreaking stuff. You probably go to school on Monday and tell all your friends about it. The ones who weren't there, they're bummed. The ones that were, they're just as blown away as you. Oh, to be alive at a time like that. And as magnificent as that is, we have something so much more glorious before us today. Just as you would want to tell your friends about the strong man and the acrobatics and the elephants, so too the people of our text, they go throughout their community and tell of the mighty works of this man in our text, this this God-man, Jesus. And just as in that illustration, you were invited in to see the extraordinary, the fantastical, and the all but unbelievable, so too today, you are invited to see the extraordinary, the fantastical, and the all but unbelievable, only to a much, much, much greater degree. So here's our title of the message for this morning. It's another long one. It's our last long one like this. The King's Authority Over His Kingdom, Part 3, Glory and Authority. You could just put glory and authority. I feel like i got to give you permission to not get a hand cramp. As many of you know, we are in a series on the Gospel of Matthew. This is a a gospel account. It's an account of the life of Jesus, uh, his teachings, and his ministry, uh, recorded by uh, Matthew, the tax collector, one of the 12 disciples of Jesus. And he wrote this in order to connect the dots in the minds of his fellow Jewish Christian brothers between the Old Testament, their Hebrew Bibles, the Jewish scriptures, with the accounts of Jesus. He's saying all of that actually points to him. And you can actually see even his birth account. It's all, it's all pre-recorded in the Old Testament, albeit in a, a dim sort of way. You don't see it completely clearly then. He makes it clear. And he takes them on this step-by-step journey through Jesus' life in order to show them from the scriptures how they point to and find fulfillment in and actually gain new clarity from Jesus. We walked through the Sermon on the Mount a while back, lots of teachings on Jesus, really um, teachings on how to live in this new kingdom that he is uh, inaugurating, he's rolling out 
from the time of our text and onwards, something that we're still awaiting the complete fulfillment of. And in this Sermon on the Mount, we, we read that he was teaching as one with authority. All of that teaching served a point to that particular truth. This man, this Jesus, he has innate authority given to him by the Father, God the Father. And he, because he is the Son of God, the one who was the principal agent in the creation of the universe, and of course, because that's the case, he can do what he wants with his creation. And so he has authority over all of this. He spoke with authority, divine authority, and now we get to see, we've been seeing in this section, he acts with divine authority also. We've seen that authority play out over the last four weeks, and as we've talked about through these miracle accounts, the, these uh, teachable moments in between also, he has authority over all of it. Let's throw that out, outline up there one more time, or last week in this section. This is how it's played out. Jesus, uh, he, he performs three miracles, and then we get a teaching. Okay, this is the man who has authority to do all of these things. And then this is what it looks like to live in light of him. This is what it looks like to follow him. That's the, the interlude that takes place between the first three and the second three. And then we get to see three more miracles. And then we got another interlude last week teaching us about how to follow him even more. In our second interlude on discipleship, we learned even more about following Jesus and how he really is once again here to throw out the script, not the scriptures themselves, but the way the scribes and the Pharisees had been interpreting them up to that point. If you've been following along in our reading plan, we just went through Jeremiah, or well, we're still in Jeremiah, but we just went through Jeremiah 8, and we read these words, How can you say we are wise, and the law of the Lord is with us? But behold, the lying pen of the scribes has made it into a lie. That's what they did. They took God's word and they twisted it. And so Jesus comes on the scene and he's, reinterpreting it for the people, interpreting it the way that it should have been interpreted all along. And all of that in an effort to reconcile a people to himself by grace, the ones he truly came to save. Not the people who already thought they were righteous, not like the Pharisees or the scribes, but the sick and the sinners and the needy. And that brings us to today's text. We see the climax of this, this section Jesus' authority, the crescendo of this grouping of miracles, and in many ways, Matthew really saved the best for last. In these accounts, we get to see perhaps more than at any point thus far the spectacle that is the Son of God, the incarnate creator of the heavens and the earth, majesty come down. And so our big idea this morning is simple. Come one, come all. Behold and exalt him. Come one. Come all, behold and exalt him. That's it. We're going to see this through four different lenses, four different um, attractions almost, right? Like you picture the, uh, the different posters that would line the big top. Come and see the man who breathes fire, right? Only this is the one who does far greater works in each of these four cases. And so as we go along this morning, that's the first thing you'll be seeing. This man is glorious, Okay, this Jesus is awesome. But in addition to that, there will be two other things I'd like you to be on the lookout for. Number one, the glory of Jesus. While we can see it in what he does, it's further emphasized in the reports that the people tell. In all but our last section, people are in awe. They're seeing what we right well should be seeing here. Okay? And number two, I want you to see that while Jesus has authority to do whatever, full stop, he is king. He also invites lowly, sick, afflicted people. He doesn't need any of their help, but he invites them into the process. He involves us. And so those are the three things. Jesus is awesome. The people can't contain themselves, and God desires participation in his work. But without further ado, step right up and see. <laughs> Firstly this, the grifter of graves, the defier of death, the magnificent conqueror of the curse. The magnificent conqueror of the curse. Our first account here is really two accounts, two different miracles kind of put into one. 
Uh, so there's 10 miracles total, which is uh, kind of a holy number. We see that a lot in Scripture, right? 10 plagues of Egypt uh, is one of them. Matthew loves to do this, to group things in such a way. That's why we had three, break, three, break, and then uh, four miracles, actually. But it's like they're three triplets because one of them is, or two of them are condensed together. It's all paired up so that Matthew's audience could easily memorize it. And we'll see that as we read the list of the 12 apostles next week. But Jesus is interrupted by a ruler, right? It says that as he is going on his way, this ruler interrupts him, very similar to the centurion in our first section of miracles in chapter 8. Our text back there offered little background. Luke 7 tells us more. And similarly here, we read about a ruler, but we read from those other gospel accounts, his name was Jairus. This was a ruler of the synagogue, which is to say he was Jewish and actually was probably a Pharisee, which is interesting. And yet, despite all that we've learned about Pharisees up to this point, this man falls to his knees before Jesus and tells him this harrowing tale. Second part of verse 18. My daughter has just died. And then note the faith here. But come lay your hand on her and she will live. There's a little bit of human participation right there, this faith that he demonstrates. So Jesus stops what he is doing to follow, but no sooner can he arrive to save this child before he's interrupted again. He's intercepted by this woman with a discharge of blood. Now, we talked about women um, previously being excluded from the gathering of uh, Jewish worship at the temple, right? They had a court of women. That's where women would do their worshiping. Um, But they were nevertheless allowed to enter enter into the temple and worship there, even though they were relegated to the court for women specifically. Now, so this is not only a woman, but a woman who would have been considered unclean by the Levitical laws. And thus, she wasn't even able to enter the court for women. This is because she has suffered for 12 years a discharge of blood, which is most likely menstruation. This woman no doubt experienced great difficulty. Imagine that, uh, having never experienced that myself. I can only know this secondhand, but 12 years of menstruation would be brutal. And on top of that, she's excluded from the gathering of God's people at the temple. The same laws for cleanliness in the Old Testament, see Leviticus 15, 19 through 33, also extend that uncleanness, interestingly, to any garment she touches which means that Jesus, by all accounts, should be made unclean just by her action. But he's not. Just like the ruler in the first two verses, she believes if she touches his garment, she'll be healed. Verse 22, Jesus is not made unclean. Instead, he makes her clean. And he encourages her. And he cites her faith as the source of her healing, which is not to say that that she did it, right? It was her faith in him that made her well. It's her faith in his abilities. And just, um, there's a couple of tangents in here, and I don't know that I'll get into all of them, okay, but just this one. uh, If you've ever been to a church that will condemn you for something because you didn't have enough faith, something bad happened in your life, um, this kind of text refutes that. It's her faith in him, okay? It's not her faith. It's not like you don't have enough faith. Uh, That is a church that you should not be attending, okay? And uh, so much hurt has come, so much damage has come from churches like that. Anyway, it's her faith in his abilities, it's her faith in him. He's the great healer, and of course, when he does, she is instantly made well. Then we get to see Jesus arrive at his destination, right? This was a, 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 an interruption. Now he's at his destination, Jairus' house. The funeral procession, procession is going on, that's what the flutes and the commotion is all about. And he tells them, verse 24, clear out. She is only sleeping. They, of course, think that that's ridiculous. This would be like the equivalent of um, somebody in our day and age dressing up in a superhero costume and approaching the edge of a building. And they're like, I'm about to fly. We'd be like, oh, are you? Oh, she's, she's sleeping. Okay, sure. That's what they're thinking. But then he touches her and she rises. Again, this also should have made him unclean. You weren't supposed to touch a dead body. Numbers 19.11, you'd be unclean for seven days. But yet again, rather than becoming unclean, he actually reverses the thing that makes her unclean in the first place, which is death. The girl rises from the dead. 
We shouldn't be surprised then when uh, whoever was there uh, go spread the report in verse 26. The report of it went throughout all that district, which is to say Galilee. So those are the details of this section. That's what happened. But what should we be understanding about it? Well, beyond the historical events, we should be tracing these back to our theme of Jesus' authority. Just as he has authority over creation, over the wind and the waves and Uh, the creatures, whether people or demons or whatever things, Jesus also has control over the stuff that's at work behind the scenes. In this case, he has authority over sin. And not just sin, we saw that he had the authority to absolve people from their sins. We see here, though, that he has authority over the effects of sin, the corruption that has occurred because sin was introduced into the world. See, there is a holy God who is perfect in every way. That's what the term holy means. It means he is other than, set apart. There's, there's, uh, we, we don't even have a frame of reference for him in this fallen world because he is so perfect and pristine and good. Like no sin dwells in him. Uh, he is light and there is no darkness in him at all, First John tells us. And this holy God created the heavens and the earth and mankind in his image. And this was a perfect picture. It was just as perfect as He was, or it was perfect in light of him, I should say. And man was warned about the death that would come should he disobey this one commandment, which is don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's it. That's the only thing that's off limits. But man disobeyed anyways. Man wanted to play God himself because Satan told him, oh no, you you will actually become like God if you eat of this. And so that's what man did. And as a result, that relationship was fractured between God and man because holy and sin, they're like two sides of the magnet. They cannot exist in the same place. They repel one another. And that relationship was forever broken. The bad news of the story. We see this picture in the fall. And this is the concept of the curse. We read in Genesis 3 all about it. After Adam and Eve ate the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, a curse was placed upon them. Genesis 3, 16 through 19. To the woman, God said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. And to Adam, he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken. For you are dust and to dust you shall return. And this is the picture that we are all born into. We are all born into this curse. Pain and childbearing. Pain and toil and work. And eventually death, all of creation is placed under this curse, us included. And we perpetuate this cycle because we are born into it and we continue to sin every single one of us. But the man and the woman uh, and the earth are not the only cursed ones we find out. God issued a curse to the devil who deceived them as well. And along with that curse came a promise, Genesis 3, 14 through 15. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. And then he says this, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. This is what has been affectionately known as the uh, Proto-Evangelium by theologians, the first gospel, because it actually foretells the whole story of redemptive history. The serpent will afflict mankind, the offsprings of the woman. But one day, a singular offspring from the woman will rise up, and he will crush the serpent's head. He will undo the effects of the fall, and that offspring's name is Jesus. God the Father will send his Son, the second person of the Holy Trinity, who has eternally existed as God, down to earth to be born of a woman, to become that offspring. Deity added DNA to his divinity. (laughs) And all in an effort to become like his creation, to take their place, to be their substitute. He lived a perfect life 
in order to earn the righteous requirement that God had. He died a substitutionary death, paying the due punishment for their sin, that their sin was due, experiencing the likes of hell that they deserved on the cross, and he was raised up on the third day for their salvation. And when he was raised up, he showed that justice had been served. The penalty had been paid, and the payment had been accepted by God the Father to make atonement for their wrongdoings such that all who turn from those wrongdoings, from their sins against their holy creator God and place their faith in that resurrected son, they will find peace with God and that relationship restored. And not only that, they can be freed from the effects of the fall, which they so tragically brought about vicariously through their ancestors in the garden. Doesn't mean it's a perfect picture now. I, I don't mean to say that God just removes sin and uh, sickness and death from our lives immediately. We still see the corruption all around us. We saw some yesterday, didn't we? But for those of us who by repentance and faith are found in him, we know that like the song says, death is just a doorway into everlasting life. Death has no hold on us. The curse has been reversed even now, even while we still experience its effects. And we know that one day he'll put a stop to it for good. All of creation redeemed the plague of corruption and death snuffed out. And for those in Christ, life eternal in that new creation, the new heavens and the new earth. That's what we see in this text. This woman bearing the effects of the fall, perhaps going back to pain and childbirth, which is another uh, uh, departure from the God-intended process of childbirth. We have an aberration in his good design even in the menstrual cycle, with it going on for 12 years straight. And Jesus puts a stop to it immediately. And all of that points to a greater spiritual reality. The word there in the Greek for her being made well is actually the Greek word sozo, which is to save. So he's literally saying here, your faith has saved you. And just as a little aside, just a small tangent, okay, just to go back to the uncleanness, she's not allowed in the temple, when he's saying that her faith has saved her, she's now saved, she's now clean, she can go into the temple, that just goes to show how much uh, the Old Testament and our Lord ties together uh, the corporate gathering with salvation, okay? We think that this is um, uh, optional. <laughs> no, this is like where, where the God stuff happens, okay? And it doesn't mean that it doesn't happen when we leave these walls, but uh, the people of the Old Testament, they tied salvation to the corporate gathering, gathering so intimately, and just to add an exc exclamation point, Jesus also raises this ruler Jairus' daughter up from the dead. It's as if to say that notion of, in the day you eat of it, this fruit, you shall surely die, that to dust you shall return. I'm master over that too. I have authority to put death under my feet. I think of 1 Corinthians 15, the last enemy to dis be destroyed is death. Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? This is what we're seeing here. The once for all conqueror of the curse. We, we see it here in a glimpse. We see it more fully at the cross, and we will see it perfectly, decisively at Jesus' return. But until then, what shall we do? How do we apply this to our lives? I have two simple charges to you, okay? And they're in line with our big idea. Behold and believe. Believe. Behold the man who has command over the curse, the one who will, will by his death and resurrection defeat and disarm death for his people, and who will, upon his return, destroy it once and for all. If you're a believer, I just want you, want you to see it. I want you to bask in the glory that is your king. Because of Jesus' work, because of this mighty man with a capital M, you have been delivered from the effects of sin to some degree now. You have the ability to say no to sin. To say no to your flesh and the influence of the world and the enemy and you can put on righteousness. If you are in Christ, you have that ability. You are no longer powerless to it. Believe that. Remind yourself of it. He has disarmed the enemy. He has delivered you from death. It has no claim on you like the other song says. You're off limits to it. Remind yourself that when you're tempted, when it feels like everything is working against you, you know who's on the throne. If you are not in Christ, my charge to you is also to believe. But believe upon him for the salvation of your soul, rather. The time for reminders, that'll come, okay? But you need to learn for the first time. 
You need to be resurrected from the dead like this woman. Then you can learn to walk that resurrected life out. I'm sure you think you're living now. You are taking in air. You are breathing it out. That's true. But there is no life apart from him. He is the way and the truth of the life and the life. And nobody comes to the Father but by him, which is to say nobody is saved but by him. Repent and believe. Place not your hopes in anything in this world or in yourself, but in Jesus Christ. Put your hope in him. So that's the first hat that we see Jesus wearing. But here's the second. Jesus is the opener of eyes, the unlocker of sight for the otherwise unseeing, the modest dispatcher of the darkness. He is the modest dispatcher of the darkness. And we see this in verses 27 through 31. Our story continues. As Jesus passed on from there, verse 27, two blind men followed him, crying aloud, have mercy on us, son of David. They're following him, um, and the title that they use goes back to chapter one, son of David. We read in the genealogy there that this was um, an indication of his uh, messiahship. I don't know if that's a word. Uh, I feel like it is. An indication that he's the Messiah, okay? The son of David title because there was the Davidic covenant in which God promised that there would be a descendant of David forever seated on the throne. And this is pointing to Jesus. And so they believe he is a long-awaited king in David's line. Jesus enters a house. It might be their house. It's most likely Jesus' house. And we know from verse 30 that he wants this to be on the down low. He's performing the miracle in the house, probably to uh, not draw undue attention. And he asks them if they believe. And to go back to what we said in our first point, they do believe. Yes, they have faith. But their faith is once again in him. In his ability to heal them. Do you see that in verse 28? Do you believe that I am able to do this? To which they replied, yes, Lord. He then touches their eyes, again, citing their faith as the cause, even though it was their faith in him. In verse 30, their eyes were open, just like that. Imagine that. We don't know how long these men had been blind, but imagine being unable to see, just darkness, and then all of a sudden the world becomes just clear and vibrant as day. Feel this man touch your eyes, and then bam, color (laughs) and light But as astonishing as this event was, Jesus turned serious. The word here could be translated to be deeply moved. This is a solemn moment, a solemn request. He says, see that no one knows about this. Don't tell anybody. And of course, they disobey. They go and spread his word throughout that entire district, the same district that we just heard in the end of our last section of verses. His fame is going throughout that whole district. We don't know exactly why Jesus requested that. I tend to think that it was in his humanity. He just wanted a break. There's a reason why he's in his house. (laughs) And the crowds are following him everywhere. He's probably, in the words of one commentator, needing a brief respite from popular pressure until he's able to leave town. In other words, in his humanity, he just needed a break. And he will not get one in our text today. That's for sure. But what is behind all of this? Well, just like our last section, there is a greater theological truth behind this incredible event. And that is the fact that every one of us is born without eyes to see. Only instead of being physically blind, the Bible tells us we're spiritually blind apart from the work of Jesus in our lives. We read in 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. That's all of our default starting points. But this Jesus, he came, in the words of Isaiah 42, 7, to open the eyes that are blind. He's here to expel the darkness. He's here to give us eyes to see, and for the believer here today, that's infinitely better than the ability to be able to see light and color and dimension physically. It's the ability to distinguish between right and wrong, the ability to see your own sin for the abomination that it is in contrast to the holiness of God, and to see the overwhelming glory, the beauty, the grace of the gospel. You see your Savior as stunning, 
Because he's lifted the veil from your eyes, you can see him clearly. And now you have the ability to come to him, just like these previously blind men crying aloud, have mercy on me, son of David. And he will. You do that once and for all in a saving sense, and then you enter into a lifelong journey of that in an incremental, bit by bit, bit by bit, progressive, holier and holier with each passing day sense. It looks like praying and asking God for his mercy anew consistently, not necessarily to save you, but to keep you from the sin that you want to do, to break sinful habits and patterns of thought, to put on Christ afresh. In other words, you keep crying out, have mercy on me, open my eyes. And believe me when I say that's a prayer that God loves to answer. And that's application for us. Like our last point, I'll put it like this, behold yet again, but also beseech. Behold your God who gives sight to the blind. He does have mercy. Though you were ignorant, though you were rebellious, so rebellious you didn't even know how rebellious he showed you. Praise him for that. And beseech him. Pray that he would show you new aspects of his character that you can behold his beauty all the more. And I would say pray that he would open your eyes to new sin in your life, to your ongoing need for a a greater sight. And then, yeah, buckle up, because he does love to answer that prayer. Uh, Yeah, he does. And when he does, you can rejoice over that too, because it's a grace that he doesn't let you just go on in the darkness. The fact that he flips on the light so that you can see your sin, it's like um, wandering through the woods in the dead of night, like pitch black, and there's nothing but nocturnal creatures that are bigger than you, right, ready to prey on you, and then God flips on the lights. That's what, that's what happens when he shows you new sin in your life. Because your sin lurking in the darkness, it's looking to kill you. Genesis 4, 6 through 7, where, where the Lord is speaking to Cain, he says, why are you angry and why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its de- desire is contrary to you. In the literal Hebrew, it's more like its desire is for you. Like it wants your life, but you must rule over it. It's after you, and you should be after it. And God's opening your eyes to it is the first step. When was the last time you pressed into this? When was the last time you were just just about positive that the other person was in the wrong, right? And yet you still prayed, you know what, God? If I'm wrong, show me. Is that a common prayer in your marriage? Or do you try to reason your way through conflicts, try to point the finger, beat them down with the facts, with logic, with guilt, with whatever? The person that prays, show me my sin, and then owns that sin, that's the prayer that he loves to answer. These men, they knew they had a problem. They knew the problem that they had. But do you? This should be our prayer. God, continue to shine a light on the sins that we, your people, are still blind to. And God, would you remove the blindfold from the eyes of those who have yet to see your beauty for the first time? Because we who have seen your beauty, we we still need to see it more fully, and they need to see it, period. So he is the magnificent conqueror of the curse. He is the modest dispatcher of the darkness. He gives us eyes to see. But he is also the upholder of the unvocal, the supporter of the silent. He is the merciful vindicator of the voiceless. The merciful vindicator of the voiceless. We see that in verses 32 through 34. Jesus is yet again interrupted. Again, I say he gets no break in this text. Two men uh, with restored sight, they're, they're leaving and, and he gets interrupted again. Verse 32, the people from the crowds bring before him a man who is demon-possessed. And as a result of this demon possession, he's unable to speak. We saw um, a while back another demon possession, an exorcism, uh, a couple weeks ago. In that case, this man had, th- those men actually, had supernatural strength. This guy has been made mute, unable to speak. And they bring this man to Jesus. We can only surmise, based on our text at the end of chapter 8, that the demons are by no means eager to be cast out, right? So they probably brought this man against his own will or the demon's will. But that's what happens. Again, I say we know this to be true just by how matter-of-fact this account is. Matthew is not trying to convince anybody. And the people in his original context, his original audience in first century AD, they were familiar with this. And so this is the the shortest account that we get so far. 
It doesn't even talk about him casting it out. It says, and when the demon had been cast out, the mute man spoke. The attention here reminds us of our first triplet of miracles. Peter's mother-in-law was at the end of three miracles and, and was similarly short. It's as if to say each miracle at the very end is just a cherry on top. Like, yeah, and he also did this. But even, even still, this is something that's astonishing. Even as for Jesus, it's just another miracle. But we do know it's amazing because of the next line there. And the crowds marveled, saying, never was anything like this seen in Israel. In other words, they were astonished. They were amazed. We've never seen anything like this. To go back to that circus illustration, right? I mean, what? this is crazy. And this is probably a response to Jesus' entire ministry, not just this one act. They've seen all of these miracles, and they're like, this, this guy is something else. But as is so often the case in Matthew's gospel, the Pharisees, they recognize just like the people that something earth-shattering is happening, but because of their hardness of heart, their obstinance, their rebellion against God, they're forced to attribute it to someone else. Like, yeah, okay, that definitely happened, but I hate it, uh, so... It must have been from the devil. They seem to attribute his power to Satan, the father of lies, rather than our father in heaven, Jesus' authority. But what does this mean? What is going on? Well, just as in the previous accounts, we have an actual historical event organized in such a way, described and written for our benefit to point to a greater spiritual authority, excuse me, a spiritual reality. Just as we recognize that resurrection is a part of salvation and having one's eyes opened is a part of salvation, so is the restoration of your faculties. So is being freed. So is being given a voice. See, people in the world, they tend to think a certain way. I don't know if you've ever heard this. Um, in circles where people struggle with addiction or substance abuse is probably the better term there, uh, they tend to think if you, if you get clean, you're going to be a boring burnout, okay? You'll end up being a shadow of your former self, okay? You don't want to get clean. Those guys are boring. Tell me that's not demonic, by the way. If you give up drugs, you lose more than addiction. Miss me with that. But similarly, and far more dangerous, I would say, There's this notion that if you were to become a Christian, you'd actually lose your personality. Like you trade in your funness and your identity for salvation. What a lie from the pit of hell. No, in actuality, when you start walking with the Lord, you're actually freed in every respect. Just like this man in these verses. Listen to how the Bible speaks to you, to, uh, excuse me. Listen to how the Bible speaks to a life before Christ. Titus 3.3, it says that you are a slave to various passions and pleasures. Second Timothy 2.26 says that you are ensnared by the devil, captured by him to do his will. Ephesians 2 talks about you following after him. That's your quote-unquote identity apart from Christ. You're not self-sufficient. You're subjugated. You're not autonomous. You're enslaved. You're not unshackled. You're a sheep, and you're being led to the slaughter by you. <laughs> actually, by your desires. And that's what makes these verses so glorious because just like you were so dead, you couldn't save yourself. You were so blind, you didn't know that you couldn't see. So too, this person in these verses was brought before Jesus. He didn't bring himself. And so while we get human participation all throughout this text, here we have an unwilling person and Jesus redeems them, brings them to full health. Jesus was merciful As far as we can tell, this person didn't even want to be saved, and that was you. You loved your life before. You may even feel that that itch to go back still to this day, but he entered in. He softened your heart. He opened your eyes. He made you alive again. He advocated on your behalf while you were still yet sinning. Romans 5, 6 through 8, For while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I mentioned earlier there's this thread of human participation, but this part right here is such an encouragement to our souls. 
because Jesus drives out the evil spirit. He frees up this person to speak. He gives them their real voice, which is what actually happens when you have faith in Jesus. It's the truest version of you, okay? But he did it all without that other person's participation whatsoever. And with that in mind, no, you know what? I'm going to pause here. Um, What an encouragement for us when we have a loved one who seems so, so, so far away from the Lord. We don't need to see a change in them uh, in order to have hope that God can save them. He can crack their heart wide open. And that is such a comfort when you pray day after day after day after day after day for their salvation. But with that in mind, let's consider a couple of takeaways for us. Number one, behold yet again. If you are in Christ, remind yourself that you have been saved by his grace. Not because you deserved it, but because he's awesome. And he loves you. Let that put wind in your sails when you think you've messed up bad enough to lose his love. You weren't good enough to get here. You're no more saved on your best day. You're no less deserving on your worst. That's number one. Number two, be free. (laughs) Whom the Son sets free are free indeed. Christ has afforded you a voice. You get to unlock your truest you, (laughs) which is you in him. It's the godliest version of you with all your personality traits, with all the ways your mind works, with specific passions and giftings that God has uniquely given to you in so much as they are not sinful, right? And then use them to glorify him. God gave you an engineer's mind. Go work at your job and grow in your giftings. And then use that engineer's mind for the kingdom. Use it in your Bible time. Help others to understand the intricacies of God's word. Oh, you've always been something of a humanitarian. Brother or sister, there are needs aplenty here. (laughs) And outside the walls. Roll up your sleeves and get in there. God wants to use you. Think of that old Uncle Sam poster. Uh, only instead of just being like a generic piece of propaganda, right? It's the God of the heavens and the earth who designed you specifically, intricately wove you in the depths of the earth, it says, and wants to use you specifically also. He doesn't want to scrub out the parts that make you you. He made you you. Be the best you that you can be for his kingdom. And just before we move on, um, I think we can take that to an individualistic level, all right? Uh, You are one member of a body, right? Uh, And so I don't say that to be like, you are awesome, okay? I don't want to make it about you or us. Rather, we should take it from you to we. Part of the best you that you can be is not putting so much emphasis on you. (laughs) That's a little digression there, digression. But we've got one more way we see our King Jesus this morning, and it is this, the compassionate caregiver, the protector of his people, the seeker of the straying. He is the missional shepherd of the sheep. He is the missional shepherd of the sheep. If you've been here a while or you're just familiar with the book of Matthew, this section may ring a bell or two. We had a very similar section at the end of chapter four, right before the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, Both sections summarize the works and extent of Jesus' ministry at that time. Um, And both sections have a final verse or two, which kind of on-ramp to the next section. Let's go ahead and throw that uh, passage up on the screen, if you don't mind. We're we're just going to compare these two. Since you have your Bibles open to chapter 9, we can just go back and forth. So verse 23 of chapter 4, Jesus is going throughout Galilee in particular. This is where Jesus lives. Uh, That's where Capernaum is. It's the northern part of modern-day Palestine. Going back to our text today, chapter 9, verse 35, he went, out th- he went throughout all the cities and villages. So a little difference there. It could still be in Galilee. There's no explicit explanation. But the point is this. He's on the move. The direction of the ministry is about to change. Same ministry, teaching in the synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, healing every disease and affliction. But this is the beginning of the end of his like hometown, everybody comes to me ministry. A new phase is taking shape. And to further emphasize that, we can compare the next verse. Chapter 4, verse 24. His fame spread throughout Syria, which was even farther north than Galilee. At that time, people were bringing their sick to him. Compare with 9, 35 and on. And we read, 
when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. The direction is rather than people coming to him, he's gearing up to send people out. We also notice from 424 that the emphasis is on how others are receiving him, right? They're bringing him their sick, whereas 936, we see Jesus' response. He has compassion. It says that they were harassed and helpless. This may very well be in light of the scribes and Pharisees who had no compassion. They rather led them astray like unfaithful shepherds. But not only that, they were critical of the good shepherd Jesus when he did enter in and take pity on them. We saw that in our verse 34 when they attributed his work to the prince of demons. Further, 425 talks about how the crowds respond to Jesus' healing ministry by following him. And this serves as a transition to the Sermon on the Mount where he's addressing the crowds. And then our last two verses here today, it's uh, it's transitioning to the next one, putting the needs of uh, the people front and center for his disciples showing that there is lots of work to do and we have few people to do it. So pray that God would raise up people. Chapter 4, they're coming to him. Chapter 9, he's getting ready to send them out. So that's what's happening on the surface, okay? But there are theological truths that we need to see before we head out of here. One thing we should see is that despite Jesus healing all these people's diseases, he was more concerned with their spiritual state. Do you see that in verse 36? It says that he's... He's healing every disease and every affliction. And yet when he saw them, he had compassion for them. They were lost and in need of guidance. Like sheep without a shepherd. We know that he came to be that for them. A role that he's really going to take on. He's going to step into in his death, resurrection, ascension, and his ongoing work on the throne. But at the time of our text, he was compassionate. You can almost feel the burden. It's as if he's just looking out at at the masses and he's just seeing the hurt. Some self-imposed, some imposed by the enemy, some just the effects of the fall, right? Sickness and death. But nonetheless, he's, he's burdened for the people. And so while we look at the theology of it all, while we remind ourselves, uh, we need to remind ourselves that he is also the compassionate shepherd. And here he is coming face to face with the hurt and heartbreak that he came to save his people from. He sees the burden on their shoulders, and in this moment, he, he shoulders some of that himself. There are different kind of churches. Um, I just met with a, a church planner who's going to be planting across town in Folsom at some point next year. And, you know, as we're talking about different churches and stuff, I think we can lump churches into a couple different camps. This one makes you feel good. And this one talks about uh, information, right? And, uh, you know, people have attributed the latter to us. Our church is an expository preaching church. That means we go verse by verse. Um, and, and we try to draw our truths from that rather than picking a topic and walking through that. It's not to say that topical preaching is necessarily bad, but this isn't a TED Talk, okay? I'm here to give you the Word of God. And the day that I don't, come for me, all right? But we can teach a lot, okay? I can teach a lot. I'm learning, all right? Thanks for being patient with me. But sometimes we just need to take a step back and see this. He is gentle and lowly in heart. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. He had compassion for the people. He sees them as sheep without a shepherd. They're harassed and helpless. And that's us. We're those sheep. We're no better or worse than these people. We're blessed because we have the whole record of his works and because we have his Holy Spirit, but we suffer the same element, uh, ailment, excuse me, and we get to behold the same Savior. And as has been the case three other times today, let's just do that. Let's behold this Savior. Our parting application is twofold. Firstly, this, look to him, look at him, and then do exactly what Jesus is saying in these last couple of verses. Live on mission. Look at him and live on mission. Remind yourself of who he is, not just yet again, okay? I'm not saying like, yeah, take a second right now and look at him. No, look at him always. Look to him in whatever season you're in. Keep your eyes locked on the one who is your compassionate shepherd. The one who raises dead hearts to life, who opens spiritually blind eyes and who frees the oppressed when they are unable, who advocates for the unvocal. And who after all of that looks out at the sea of people and is burdened. 
and then turns to his disciples and tells them to pray for more gospel workers, to tend to those sheep. And that brings us to our second piece of application. And my final word for you this morning, live on mission. That means seeing the people the way Christ does. In your workplace, at the store, at the gym, uh, in your home if you have unsaved children or loved ones, and demonstrating compassion toward them. If we saw them the way he did, how, how broken would our hearts be? Would we see their sin as clearly as we do, right? We're so quick to point out sin. Or would we see their separation from God far more clearly? And then would we pray for them? Praying for their salvation. And, and this one is a good prayer. We, we pray this often. Um, it's, it's like this. Pray that the Lord uh, of the harvest would raise up other laborers into the harvest. God, give us boldness. Give us gospel opportunities. But it doesn't have to be us. Send another Christian too. I want to do the work. I, I want to see them saved because you gave me your word and I preached it to them and, and they repented and believed, okay? I, I would rather have that, okay? Selfishly. But if you want to raise up other people, that's awesome too. I don't care. I just want them saved. And that's especially comforting when they live far away, right? God, there's Christians out there. You could raise them up. But then the other part of this living on mission, it's that you do have to speak up, okay? And if you're looking to him like we're talking about here, if you recognize how glorious your salvation is, that you were raised to life, that you were made to see, that you were freed and made to speak, and you viewed these people the way that Jesus does, you won't be able to help yourself. We'll be just like the people throughout this text who just, they can't even shut up about it, even when they're warned. <laughs> and the truth is, we're actually not warned. We're, we're commanded to do it. <laughs> we're called to speak. And we're called to be prepared to do so also, which means training. If you're, if you're not in a home group, okay, uh, something we do in our home groups is we recite the gospel to one another. We practice sharing the gospel in the context of other believers. It's like, it's like a, um, it's not the mission field, okay? It's like the training ground. It's like boot camp. Okay, get ready so that you can go out there and do that. If you're not in a home group, please let me encourage you to do just that. We need to be refreshing ourselves with the gospel, you're not going to be in an elevator and it's just going to come to you if you're not praying it to the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for sending your son to take my place because I'm a sinner and I need salvation. If you're not praying those kind of things, how's it going to come to you in that moment? But home groups is a great place for that. This is our God, church. <laughs> come and behold him. Behold this magnificent Savior of ours who conquers the curse, who dispatches the darkness from your eyes, who vindicates the voiceless, who gives you a voice, and who perfectly plays the great shepherd of the sheep. And he does all of that for those who would turn from their sin and put their faith in his mighty name. Let's pray in that name now. Heavenly Father, we, once again, we give you all the glory. You are God and we are not. I thank you for that word. What a sweet song. Would you be our wisdom? Would you guide us in this world, Lord? Um, on our best day, we recognize we don't do it perfectly. On our best day, we recognize we're no more deserving. We thank you for being merciful. We thank you for entering into the picture, for pursuing us. Though we were dragged before you, perhaps by others who repeatedly shared the gospel with us, it was not our desire to be yours. Yet you won us over. You opened our eyes. You showed us the truth in light of your word, God, and we thank you for it. I pray, God, that we would just, I pray that we would just continue to behold you and that we would live in light of who you are. If we just keep our eyes on you, if we just keep our nose in this book, if we just keep our knees on the ground in prayer to you and communion with you, if we just keep being around your people, God, I don't see how we don't live this out. Because you're going to convict us by your spirit as we read your words, as we pray to you, as we engage with other saints who have eyes on our sin too, that we're still blind to. Lord, I pray that you would continue to do this work that you started in us, and I pray that knowing that you will. Because he who began a good work in us will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Thank you for that word. Thank you for you above all things. Pray that the rest of our time here today and as we go out of here would be glorifying to you, pleasing in your sight. For you are worthy. In your son's name we pray. Amen.